lunch. And um, next on the agenda today, we're going to hear from uh, Warm Springs Care Farm, and they will tell us about their program. And then we also have a wonderful um, short film to share with you. So enjoy. Well, thank you so much. Welcome everybody. My name is Linda Martinez Haley, and I'm the founder, co-director, co-founder co and director of the Warm Springs Care Farm located in the east end of Boise, Idaho. Um, I would just want to start with introductions. And so I'll tell you as a quick introduction, I take care of a husband and three children. I take care of four goats, a horse, a dog, a very big dog, uh, 15 ducks, five chickens, four cats, and all the wonderful people who I am blessed to serve here at the care farm. And this is Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Amy Hublo, and I am a marriage and family therapist, and I run Imagine That Farm, which is a therapeutic farm um, like Warm Springs, and Warm Springs is our partner. And I, um, I take care of a husband, three teenagers, three dogs, two cats, six horses, five goats, 13 chickens, eight ducks, and I try to find time to take care of myself in between. And Deborah, I'm Deborah McFadden, and I'm a co-founder, and I also serve on the board. I have a husband, three boys, and five cats. Um, and Deborah, I've neglected one key thing. I we I asked that all of us as introductions that we talk about our favorite animals. So quickly, I'll just say my favorite animal has always been my whole life the horse. And you, Amy. Um, it used to be the horse and now it's the goat um, because the goat is the lowest maintenance. And um, one of the things about my favorite animal is that um, they nourish me. And that's going to be a little bit about what we're talking about today is how we get taken care of. And the goats really do a lot of taking care of me. My current favorite animal is my cat, Jimmy. My husband calls him my therapy cat beautiful excellent well we just have a quick slideshow just so that you can get a, a little glimpse into who we are and what we're doing here um, you see on the first slide here we have our big puppy um, Abi Aslan which means big brother lion in Turkish um, his breed comes from Turkey originally and they are the guardians of the flock um, right now Abi's best friend is the horse Disco and that's very unusual but as you know, sometimes we have unusual friendships because they come out of nowhere and they're with people that you might not think uh, will fill you in that way. But right now, this horse and this dog are literally inseparable. <laughs> so next slide. Um, Amy talked a little bit how how low maintenance the goats are, and it's true. They are just a love. Uh, you're looking at Carter and Amelie, um, the two black goats, brother and sister, half Nigerian, half dwarf. And then that's Bonnie, um, affectionately known as Bon Bon. Uh, <laughs> and she is a Nigerian, and we just do a lot of fun things here at the farm with the goats. Um, there are goat classes, goat family goat day at the farm, and Amy Hubo does just an amazing job teaching about the goat, but in learning about the goat, one learns about themselves, so that's a really neat thing. Next slide. Um, chickens and ducks cannot be ignored, must not be underestimated. You know, when we started this, we thought, oh, everyone, the horse, the goats, the dog. And the truth is, there are many people who don't really like furry animals, but they have a thing with birds. And we have found here at the farm that the chickens and the ducks are some of the best therapists on the farm. Um, in that duck pen, we have 15 ducks and you have every issue from competition and jealousy, life, death, birth. Um, it's really a neat thing. So you're looking at um, the late, great cutie carrot, the chicken on the far left. Uh, and that's her visiting with some visitors from the farm. And then that is the grand duck of the farm who is, his name is Muffin and that he's a Pekin. Uh, and this is one of his tricks is eating out of the cup. Next slide. Um, the puppy, Abby, um, he's he's quite a handful right now, but he's turn, he's gonna turn into one of the best therapy dogs that you'll see. So we're excited about him. Next slide. So one of the great programs we offer here is the Girls Leadership with Horses. Amy runs that, and um, it's building leadership. It's sort of, in many ways, sneaky therapy um, because animals are fabulous therapists, and, and everything that we struggle with, I think they struggle with. And so we find a lot of different ways to help girls grow 
um, and nurture themselves during a very difficult age, as you know, the preteen and, and teen ages. So next slide. Um, I'm an Ada County Master Gardener, so I do a lot of the horticultural therapy, the out green therapy, the nature therapy, however you want to call it. And it really is a big part of why we founded this place. We want to get people off screens and into green. And so this is just a little sampling of what we have going on here. Next slide. And of course, movement. Movement is everything, right? If we stay in these chairs all day, what's going to happen to us? So we have to move. And a lot of the children and young people are not spending enough time doing this. So um, yoga, movement, breath, mindfulness, all of these things build resilience. Um, so we do a lot of them with teachers who are here for retreats, therapists on retreat, or just children of all ages. Next slide. Uh, music therapy is an also a beautiful part of this farm. Um, a great surprise to me because I didn't know anything about music therapy when I started this, but children beat drums and they sing and they share and they talk about music the way that we used to when we grew up. Remember, we used to sit around and listen to music and talk about it. I I'd like to revive that, get these kids off the screen. So that's a nice little look into our music program. Next slide. Yeah, and the truth is that we're, we care for animals here, but these animals take care of us too. And that's a little bit why we're all here today to have this conversation about this beautiful movie you're about to watch. Um, but uh, I think it's it's fascinating to see how all of us connect differently to different animals and how they fill us. Next slide. So to learn more about our farm-based therapy program, we're at, we're at warmspringscarefarm.com warmspringscarefarm.com. You can find everything you need to know about that. Um, but yeah, that's a nice little picture of one of our visitors to the farm um, connecting with this horse. And this horse, I'm telling you, she just knows that this little girl has a hurt in her heart. And I don't know if you can see it or feel it through the screen, but I can tell you when I took that picture, I could almost just hear them both breathing together. So beautiful connection. But thank you for that little um, opportunity for us to give you a glimpse, a little farm tour. But we're very excited now to, um, you know, launch into our main feature here. So Amy, did you want to? Yeah, I think I just want to follow up with, um, we showed you a lot of pictures and talked about programs that are targeted towards children, but we do a lot of work with adults and we have some very special programs that are designed for caregivers who are experiencing a variety of kind of stress injuries as a result of their caregiving roles. And so that's part of what we're going to be talking about with you guys today in terms of the pressures that we all experience in caregiving roles and the self-care that's required in order to stay sustainable in these roles. And um, thank you for coming together and joining us in this breakout session. And uh, Deb, I'm going to just invite you to add anything before we go into the movie. Yeah, as we are about to um, head into the movie, we'll be thinking about um, what animal roles are in your life, how animals play a role in your life. And if you have a particular animal you can think of that has had a powerful impact in your life. Thank you. I think with that said, we're ready to watch our, our clip of Owen and Hatchie. All right, folks, bear with me while I share my screen here. And while you're talking, yeah, it's fine. You could put it on anytime. But today, later this afternoon, we're actually hosting an adult session here on narcissistic behavior. Um, so it's a group for adults, as an example. Enjoy the film. Can anybody hear this? Not yet. Turn off your sound to come from here. Well, as she's fussing away, I will just um, briefly continue what I was saying that if you look at our website, we have all of our information about all of our programs there. And, you know, if any of you are interested in starting something like this, Amy and I have a dream that more people will open care farms. They're all over Europe. So we'd love to see more in Idaho, but check out our website and you'll see how you can get all that taken care of. Enjoy the film. Five. All right. Sorry, everyone. Hang tight one more second. There was sound there.
Owen Hawkins was born August 25th, 2000. Now. We well, are. Hannah, you go ahead and keep, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, uh, Hannah, just wanted to let you know we are able to hear the film if you're. Ah, okay, thank you. Owen Hawkins was born August 25th, 2005. All right. By the time Owen was 18 months old, he wasn't playing or moving the way other toddlers did. We did about three months of testing and our doctors said, um, I'm going to write down a name and this is what I am 99% sure Owen's got. What did he tell you? And he wrote down schwartz champel syndrome. schwartz champel syndrome is a condition um, that has a genetic basis, and it is a condition that affects... Sarah, it's playing on my end. Is it playing on your end? No. We have audio, but we don't have visual. So that looks to me like an internet issue. Uh, it's it is playing, but it, the sound is not aligning with the with the video. But we can hear it. So, well, that usually okay. happens when this joking things on the internet. Owen Hawkins was born August twenty fifth, two thousand five. By the time Owen was eighteen months old. He wasn't playing or moving the way the other toddlers did. We did about three months of testing and our doctors said, um, I'm going to write down a name and this is what I am 99% sure Owen's got. What did he tell you? And he wrote down schwartz champel syndrome. schwartz champel syndrome is a condition um, that has a genetic basis and it is a condition that affects muscles leading them to become stiff. There's persistent muscular contraction. The children actually look like little bodybuilders. Felt pissed off. He'll never be able to run. He'll never be able to kick a football properly. His walking's gonna diminish. How rare is the condition? We know about approximately 35 to 40 people in the world with it. Owen received the diagnosis at two years old. He is nine now. Despite having a normal life expectancy, the condition affects him in many ways, from difficulty with his eyesight to the nearly constant pain he faces every day. How painful is it? A little bit painful. It hurts quite a lot, actually. I think he probably is in quite a lot of pain at different times from his joints and from his muscles. Have a little stretch. Oh. I think he's a very brave little boy. This one get it, Daddy. Which one? It really hurts. Is it? We sit, move that out. Even during our 45 minute interview, Owen struggled often to sit comfortably. He had to stop twice. How do you live with the pain, Owen? Very hard pain. Very painful. I have to man up and take it. Take it on man. As Owen grew, his parents introduced him to his first wheelchair to help with mobility. It got two different sides. But the chair created other challenges. He became anxious prior to going out of the house. He would get a little bit flustered and, and be slightly uncoordinated if you're trying to put his coat on. He says, people are staring at me. I don't like it. They're pointing at me, they're laughing, and I hadn't noticed. How did that make you feel? Alone. Alone. Sorry, 
wanting to help Owen feel less alone. His parents agreed on an age-old remedy. I was flipping through Facebook. All I saw was the eyes just staring straight out at the screen through me. On February 1st, 2012, they found Hatchie. What we'd been informed had happened to Hatchie is that he had been tied to a railway line and had been hit by a train. Hatchie, a five-month-old Anatolian shepherd, was found here at a train yard in northeast London where he'd been left to die. The dog, initially named Stray E10, was treated for a serious head injury and his tail and hind left leg were nearly severed. Both would be amputated. After a month in Harmsworth Animal Hospital, he was scheduled to be euthanized. There was something in his eyes that said, you can't put me down, I'm here for a reason. On February 18th, 2012, Will and Colleen brought home an 80-pound, three-legged sense of hope named Hatchie to surprise six-year-old, 40-pound Owen. He just gently um, put um, his head right on my lap. And I said, hello, Hatchie. It was like... Me understanding what happened to Hatchie, and Hatchie understands what disability I have. There was just this connection that I, I can't put into words. It was, it was, it was magical. It was as if two lost souls had met again. <laughs> that bond sparked an immediate change in Owen. Instead of shying away from the wheelchair, Owen started looking for it. Are we taking Hatchie for a walk today? Over a space of a week or two, he was realising that people were not staring at him, he was staring at his dog. What started to happen when you went for a walk? <laughs> I'm not sure anymore. That's how he changed my life. Hatchie gave him the three legs required to push the two wheels forward and make him realize that it's okay to be Owen Halkins. In the summer of 2012, the family decided to enter Hatchie in a local dog show in the category for best rescue dog, dogs rescued from shelters. And they won. The fact that Owen won and he won something, he was like, yes, we're doing this all the time, Dad. Every weekend we're doing a dog show. And they did. And at every subsequent show, the boy and his dog won. Which of those awards means the most to you? Well, the um, Big Crofts one. Crofts is the Westminster Dog Show of England. It is televised across the United Kingdom. In 2013, Owen and Hatchie were among five nominees from across the country for the Friends for Life Award, a category celebrating dogs who embody the title of man's best friend. The winner is selected by a public vote. Now here's our youngest finalist in Friends for Life. This is Owen. And how much does it mean to you to be here in the final of Friends for Life? I think we can see how much it means in your face. Good luck to you, Owen, and thank you for being here. Yeah. 
winner of Friends for Life 2013 with 54% of the vote is Owen and Hatchie. I want to say thank you for all of you for voting for me. I was really, really shocked. I was like, what the? Winning the um, biggest dog show in the whole UK. Boom. That's how I will. <laughs> Have you heard the one about the boy and the dog? It's about survival and acceptance, judgment, and friendship. What do you want people to see when they look at you and Hatchie? Someone with a rare disability, with a, um, with a giant dog, I should say, with his tail and leg chopped off. That is what I want them to see. I'll tell you what I see. I see best friends. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think um it's the third time I've watched that and probably the first time I haven't cried. Um and I just want to invite you guys to take a breath um and just take all of that in and release, you know, any sort of tension that you might be holding for yourself right now. Um there's so many angles we could go into with this film. Um you know, there's, there's themes around having purpose and having another one to care for. Um, but what we decided we wanted to focus on today is the way that Hatchy alleviated some of the pressure in the home, alleviated some of the pressure that Owen was holding about his disability alleviating some of the pressure that the parents were experiencing and having a child that had a disability that didn't want to go out into the world. And so what we want to do is invite you to explore for yourselves where there is pressure and where you're holding the pressure in your role as a caregiver and imagining what are the things, the people, the pets, the places, the experiences that can help lift some of that pressure? Because when we start talking about resilience, what we're talking about is an awareness of where pressure is coming from, an identification of what our needs are, and an action towards getting some of those needs met so that we can continue to help others. And so consider again, where is the pressure and how is it being expressed in your system, whether it's your family system or um, with the person that you're, that you're caregiving towards um, how does that pressure get relieved? And let's just think about that for a moment. And if you have any comments that you want to share or responses that you'd like to share with the group, we're certainly open and we welcome that feedback. Deb? Um, I was just observing momentarily in the group chat, people were requesting um, ability to visit the farm. And so we would just want to direct you to the website. And that way you can contact us to set up visits or um, anything else that you would like to, to do with us. Um, we're happy to take in volunteers. We're happy to do tours and uh, facilitate many different options. Um, 
if anybody has any comments with what Amy had said, um, we'd love if people wanted to unmute and just chime in. So thinking again about the role that Hatchie played, not only with Owen, but within the family and the whole system, um, think about, um, again, those things that might help allevi alleviate that pressure for you guys. And sometimes it is a pet. Um, not everybody has pets. And so we want you to think and imagine if an animal is not part of that um, process for you, if you don't have access to a pet or an animal that you love as much as Hatchie was loved, you know, can you imagine something else that would provide that, um, that purpose for you? Deb, do you want to, do you want to, do you want to chime in on that, Deb? Well, those, the hands are raised. We have a couple. Oh, of okay. Hands. So Deborah Schumacher. So Deborah wants to make a comment. Same with two other people. Okay. So we're trying to figure out how to. Um, oh, she doesn't have the ability to unmute and chime in. You know, okay. do you want to put go into the chat then? She can type. I don't think it's enabled. The Q and A. No, the Q and A is where individuals will need to interact in this session. So, so Deborah, if you wouldn't mind putting your comment in the chat, and um, we're or not in the chat, excuse me, in the Q and A, and we're able to to um, see your note there. Thank sure. you. One more option: if you go under for us as panelists, there is an option under participants for those with their uh, hand raised. You can allow them to talk. So, if you click the allow to talk button, Deborah should be able to share her thought. Okay. It looks like Charlene had said that um, stress relief is from camping and being in the wilderness for her. Mm. Great. Yeah, you know, there's there's this idea too that we have to go somewhere in order to get respite or in order to get support, and that self care is sort of this event that we schedule. And one of the things um, that I love about the example of camping is what you're doing is you're taking yourself into nature and you're taking yourself away from the pressures of life. And what I want to offer on a daily practice is that that nature is accessible to you by walking out your front door, by going for a walk, by engaging with a garden, by just stepping outside and feeling the air on your skin and the sun on your face. There's so many ways that we can embrace that and access the, the self-care that comes with just engaging our five senses. And we forget that we have such immediate access to that. So if we need a break, stepping outside, taking your shoes off, feeling the ground underneath your feet, feeling the warmth of the sun on your face and your shoulders, smelling a flower, touching grass, you know, touching a tree, like all of these reconnect us. And we don't have to go far in order to find that. There's a question. We have to get out of the idea that our self-care and our respite and our ability to decompress from pressure is something out there, something that we have to go find, something that we have to schedule, something that we have to plan for. Self-care is a microdosing of those practices of taking care of self throughout the day. It's recognizing that when you need to go use the bathroom, you need to go take care of your body and use the bathroom. When you need a drink of water or when you need food, when instead of putting attendee. Deborah, your your microphone is live now. Okay. okay. Hi. Deborah, you have your hand I, up. I'm not Deborah. I am her mother-in-law. Okay. My name is Maureen O'Donnell. We join you every year. 
And I just wanted to mention that recently I have two men and a woman in my home as clients and the two men are with Molina. And recently we were told that they have $110 every three months to spend on pet supplies. And that can be pet toys, pet anything. And so we have two dogs and three cats and a, an aquarium of fish. And I'll tell you, we have a very cool, passive climate in our home. Uh, they both are, both my guys are on anxiety and depression meds mm -hmm. and they love the animals. That's half of their conversations in a day is what their animals are doing. And what, what I'm thrilled about is that our, their insurance is now acknowledging the benefit of having pets in the home. <laughs> I think it's yeah. terrific. Yeah. Now mute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Maureen. It looks like Dory Ray's had mentioned that her daughter loves music. So a big part of their lives is um, revolves around that and it can help calm her and focus her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And drumming, all of these things that you're mentioning, animals and nature. Um, and remember, you know, in every county in Idaho, there's a master gardener program and you can get resources there on how you can create your own indoor garden or outdoor garden. Um, we use a lot of perennial herbs here at the farm and I dry them all. And just yesterday I went to a school um, and I brought about 15 herbs and they went through a whole smell therapy. And you can't imagine what that's like. It's just, it was, there were dried herbs. So not that beautiful to look at, but you should see the reactions that it gets out of people because, you know, we're forgetting our, how to use our nose. We're forgetting how to sniff. We're forgetting how to um, use our animal senses. And so um, just, just a few ideas there. And, and don't, don't forget to just really look around you. Sometimes there are resources around you that aren't that hard to get. And it's just that we haven't thought of them. So that was a great example from Maureen. And uh, is there anyone else in the chat, Deb, that has? Yeah, Melissa Mitchell. I'm just going to read what she wrote. I'm a mother of a now 25-year-old disabled son. And oftentimes I feel more like a nurse than a mother. For a long time, as I felt as though my only purpose was that is what I could do for him. I wasn't sure if I was really loved or worthy of love. About seven years ago, I got a little rescue dog that has given me that unconditional love that I felt missing. I love my son. And of course, I know that he loves me, but that little dog saves me on a daily basis. Hmm. Yeah, I love that um, because oftentimes um, those that we're taking care of, they don't, sometimes they don't have the capacity to meet our needs, right? And so being able to find that, um, whether it's in a puppy or a kitten or in something else and being able to receive that kind of unconditional love, it's just, it fuels us and it, it offers us a lot of what we need to keep going. Does anybody else have any ideas um, other than animals or if you want to share an animal story of how it helps provide uh, support or relieve some of the pressure for you. Yeah. I'm wondering if anybody has um, a different experience where they would feel like adding a pet to their family would add more pressure. Yes. Because there is, it does, you know, require more care giving. <laughs> um, and so that's why we try to focus on Hatchy was a wonderful resource for Owen and his family and animals have proven to be wonderful resources um, for us and our own lives, but it's not for everybody. So there are other ways and we do want to just encourage you guys to consider as a concept, where is your hatchy? Who is your hatchy? And how can you get some of that um, unconditional love and some of that uh, relief of pressure 
even if it's if it's not through an animal, it could be with anything. Um, we've got hey, Nancy Mary, Roberts Mary's saying that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, Nancy Roberts was saying that to alleviate <clears throat> some tension and pressure for her, she does uh, video calls with her daughters. So reaching out mm. to a loved one. Um, and then another one I wanted to highlight was when the cat passed away, they didn't want another because of the grief. And I can speak to that. I'm still not ready to get another dog because I loved my dog more than I thought you could love an animal. And I'm not ready for that level of grief and attachment with an animal, but, uh, I settled on cats and I found that they bring me a lot of joy and I don't get as, um, emotionally intertwined. So if a cat doesn't work, maybe a fish, I, my very best friend so enjoys her fish and they just, they're her companions. Um, so not to put pressure that you need an animal, but sometimes getting one that requires less from you can still be, um, respite. Well, fish can be very meditative to watch. You know, it's a very meditative practice. There's a great comment about robotic cats and dogs as well, which is a great idea. But I think Mary Spears has her hand up and she has access to sound now. Great. I was going to okay. say, it let me join as a panelist. And I was like, that's cool. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'm a caregiver of my dad an adult daughter with uh, dual mental health and cognitive impairment who has a service animal. I have a 16 year old and a nine year old and a five year old and eight fish and two rats and a bearded dragon and a ball python. So yes, I get the, the, the lots of animals and it took going through two different dogs to find one that would actually work as a service animal mm -hmm. for, for my adult daughter, because there's certain things that the animal needs to be able to do in a service capacity versus a pet capacity and making sure those differences are really honored when going out in public. There's a lot of training and specific things that service animals do that companion pets don't. And I've really appreciated her having that service animal to help with those things that she needs. And then we have our pets. And I will, I'm will. i gonna say, I love our dogs, but recently I have felt a lot of stress with them because my, my nine-year-old and my five-year-old cannot do the walking and the getting them out and engaging them the way you want to engage a dog. And then I'm very happy with my, my lizards because they're, I think that's the right amount of investment I need for a pet. Something that I only have to feed like once a week or once every two or three days. I can make them a cool environment. Yep. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Mary. Um, well, that was great that we were able to touch on that topic of pressure. And in the film, I just was really, it hit me the way that that animal not only helped the child, but helped the parents. Um, there's just sort of pressure being relieved all around. I mean, then we're not even discussing the pressure that the dog got to relieve by finding this home and this family. And um, it's been really powerful to, in, in what we're doing here. Um, you know, when I started this, I thought, oh, I got to find myself some therapists and we got to get the right people in here. And, you know, it's funny that the animals are little therapists and for every person, there's something different. I'll tell you, we had a real tragedy this week. Um, there was a, a real tragic death of one of the parents of someone who comes here and the, the, the widow on her, on the first day it happened, she called me and she cried. And, um, I thought to myself secretly, oh, I can't believe she's calling me. I, I said, honey, what can I do for you? And she said, can I please get my daughter in with the horse? I just, she just needs to be with a horse. And that was top of her priority. And, you know, the next day they had just a very therapeutic day and that horse is almost like it just reset her. It was just so powerful. And, you know, for some people it's a lizard or a snake. It doesn't really matter what it is. Or for me, honestly, the, the plants do it for me. I really feel strongly about the need to have greenery around me. Um, in one of the barn stalls out in the barn, we actually have fake plants and you guys, fake plants can give you that feeling. It brings your blood pressure down. And I think about 
um, the earlier discussion with dogs and how they can be a really a handful. This puppy, I'm going to be honest, I didn't really want the puppy. Everyone else wanted the puppy, but me. I mean, dogs are hard. You can't compost their waste. I can compost everybody else's waste on the farm. So it's just lots of extra work. But when I see my husband who has high blood pressure and high cholesterol, and I see him hugging the horse and petting the dog and, and how much the dog has relieved pressure um, on the horse, because the horse actually lost its mate in November. So again, these animal dynamics are, are worth looking at because you can really learn a lot from them. So you know, this is an important idea from this film, not just that, oh, it's touching that man bonds with dog, but it, it's how, what are you doing in your life to find ways to open windows to invite some alleviation, some 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 alleve for you. And at that note, we have about five minutes left. And I just wanted to, you know, see if there were any other questions or ideas or thoughts that any of you might have um, thinking about the film, thinking about our discussion, thinking about pressure, thinking about questions that you might have regarding this topic. Deb, do you have any that came in? Um, I'm commenting as fast as I can on some, but one standing out and um, this person, uh, Jody, is saying that she'd be too overwhelmed to get a pet and makes her feel selfish. And um, definitely I would let Amy speak to that, but I. Yeah, I think that um so if I'm understanding it correctly, that having a pet would actually be more pressure and that maybe it's making you feel selfish that you don't want that additional responsibility. Is that an accurate reading, Deb, of the yeah. comment? Yeah, that's okay. Correct. Yeah. So I think that that is so fair. And I just want to acknowledge you for knowing yourself well enough and having that sense of awareness that you know that that is actually something that's going to add pressure to the system for you. And that is completely okay to have a boundary around that and say, that is not what's right for me. That is not what is right for this system. That boundary, that knowingness and awareness that you have, that is self-care. <laughs> that is you taking care of yourself. And Amy, don't you think that she could find a way to visit animals or foster? Or not even, animals might not be her thing. Yeah. And so again, what I really want to encourage you guys to do is um, think about self-care as something that is a daily practice, that it is something that um, takes the stress off of you. And so again, it might be an action or it might be something more passive. It might be going outside. It might be um, a number of different things. And really the, the movie and the purpose of this conversation for us is to look at where and what are the things, places, people, animals, situations, experiences that can help you replenish and that feed you and make you feel stronger and just reduce some of the, the burden. Yeah. Do you have any, more, any thoughts there in the room that you um, want to share? One more was um, feeding birds outside and that's, that's a oh. nice um, oh, and, and as a master gardener, I have to say that, you know, you can, in Idaho, you can plant so many natives that attract birds. And that's one thing that I've done here at the farm is I've intentionally planted only things that bring birds or pollinators or butterflies. And so absolutely great idea. As yeah. easy as throwing wildflower seeds native to the Northwest. And lastly, it looks like, um, I don't know if you pronounce it as one word, but I'm just going to say the acronym S-E-I-C-C-A and Area V Agency on Aging have the robotic pets. So mm. several people have said that those have been great um, if you have an allergy propensity. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Purpose. It's good. Well, we have about two minutes left and I know that um, our monitors may have a few words, but I just want to say that it's been a really an honor for the three of us to take part in your conference because this is such an important thing that you're all doing, taking time for yourselves to, um, you know, to better your practice at whoever you're taking care of. 
Um, we, you know, are dedicated to, we, we know we are a sanctuary. Our, our job is to bring together animals and people to connect, heal, and grow. And so I really do hope that these two, Hatchie and Owen, um, will continue to inspire you guys every day as you care for yourselves and as you care for others. And um, may you not only be able to reach a different part of yourself, but may you be able to reach those that you care for at a, at a more at a deeper level, um, if that's possible. So, and we're here for you. If you want to go to the website, www.warmspringscarefarm.com. Um, we'd love to maybe host an in-person conference next year for you guys. <laughs> um, we've had several of those here, haven't we? The mm -hmm. Idaho Counselors Association has been here for their retreat. So um, because our mission is to take care of others, we like to take care of the caretakers. And that's why we're doing this. So if we can help the helpers, we feel like we're helping um, a lot more than we're actually helping. So um, yeah, with that, I think I'll see if our... If the acronym or... is um, Southeastern Idaho Community Action Agency, S-E-I-C-A. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for a wonderful um, discussion, a great movie. I think we would all agree that we will remember it for a long time. So um, we need to... To move on through the afternoon, we need to leave this session and join us for an, a discussion on intimacy. That is the next um, agenda item for all of you. And after that, there will be a series of breakouts. So you have to leave this session and then join the intimacy discussion. But thank you, thank you, thank you. This was a, a really wonderful way to spend the middle of our day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So we can go ahead and enter. Do we need to check that? Just close it. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Figure out.